Welcome in Christ's name to Oma EPC and our Sunday morning message. I hope this finds you well. Please do remember that this evening at 7 p.m. another message will be available via YouTube. Then on Wednesday at 8 p.m. there is our Bible study and prayer meeting. Uh, we're meeting in person now here in the church, so please do come along if you can. But if you can't, then the message will again be available via YouTube. And then Lord, next Lord's Day, there's the service at 11.30 in the morning and a message available in the evening at 7 p.m. Well, we're going to turn to the scriptures. And firstly, we're turning to Genesis chapter 10, where we're going to read the first and the last verses of this, pas of this chapter. And then we're going to read the first nine verses of chapter 11. So turning firstly to Genesis chapter 10, where we're going to read verse 1 and then verse 32. Let's hear God's word. These are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born to them after the flood. These are the clans of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, in their nations. And from these, the nations spread abroad on the earth after the flood. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shina and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they purpose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts this morning. Let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, as we bow before the throne of heavenly grace on this beautiful Sabbath day morning, Lord, we are truly amazed at the depths of your love towards us, a love that is older than creation itself. We thank you that you set your love upon your people before the world was, and that you purpose to save them through the sending of your Son. Lord, how we praise you for Christ and for all that he has accomplished through his incarnation, through his life, his death, his resurrection. And we thank you that even now, Christ, the one whom we love, is seated in, at your right hand and enthroned in glory, and that there he continues his work of intercession on our behalf. O oh, loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which you have caused the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts so that the glorious gospel promises have become ours. We thank you for the miracle of the new birth, 
for the way in which our hearts have been changed and our eyes have been opened. We thank you that we can say this morning that we love Christ. We pray to the Lord that you would bless us as we turn to the scriptures this morning, that you would give us understanding of your word and that your word would prove profitable to us. We pray, O Lord our God, that your word might feed our souls, that your word might equip us as your people, because we ask it in the glorious name of Jesus. Amen. Back in March of last year, we commenced a new series on the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Now, we didn't get very far, and we didn't get very far because the following Sunday, we were immediately plunged into lockdown. Now, after a break of six months, we recommenced things in October, and since then, we have made our way through these foundational chapters. And hopefully as we've done so, we have seen just how important and relevant they are. It doesn't matter what we're thinking about. It may be our origins, the environment, human sexuality, male and female roles and relationships, the problem of evil, our own lost estate, all these issues find answers in these chapters. Now, they may have been written thousands of years ago, but they are smack up to date, and they have something to say to us in the 21st century. Now, this morning, we're coming to chapter 11, verses 1 to 9 which will be our final study in this series. Because from chapter 11 and verse 10 onwards, what we have is the introduction to the story of Abraham that follows. But although this will be our final study, Genesis has lost none of its relevance. And Chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, which has been so carefully crafted by Moses, speaks right into our world in ways that are very striking. So please open your Bibles and turn with me to our passage this morning, where there are a number of things that we need to notice. Firstly, There is man's amazing ingenuity. There's man's amazing ingenuity. Um, Have you noticed that there is something in us as human beings that is captivated by things that are bigger, faster, higher, longer, deeper than others? Uh, Perhaps you're old enough to remember that TV uh, series, um, Record Breakers. Or or perhaps you used to buy uh, copies of the uh, Guinness Book of Records. Uh, If you can remember that book, you'll know that nobody wanted old copies of that book, did they? They wanted the latest copy with the up-to-date facts and figures. We're just intrigued by the fastest car, the longest tunnel, the biggest ship, the deepest mine, and the tallest building. Uh, No one queues up and pays good money to stand on your roof, do they? But they do queue up and they do pay good money to go to the top of buildings like the Shard in London. As a race, we are constantly pushing the boundaries and employing all our ingenuity to go that one step further. And that desire enables us to do 
amazing things. And we see this spirit in our text. Uh, As post-flood man migrates from the region of Ararat, Uh, they come to a a fertile plain uh, called China, which is more or less modern-day Iraq. And they decide to build a city. Now, there have been cities before, but they've been pretty uh, primitive affairs. But this is something new, and they employ new technology with kiln-baked bricks and tar as mortar. You see, this is a, another step forward. Uh, this is a city on a, an entirely new scale. And like modern cities, it's to have a centre. At the heart of this city is going to be a tower with its top in the heavens. This is where your world trade centres, your caliphs, your empire states and your shards begin. And it speaks of man's amazing ingenuity. An ingenuity that reflects the fact that we have been made in the image of God and that we have been given remarkable capabilities. So there's man's amazing ingenuity here. But secondly, there is also the sinister side to man's amazing ingenuity. What men do here is impressive, but it is also deeply disturbing. All the signs are wrong. All the signs are bad. And notice, for example, the direction in which these people are going. We're told in verse 2, and the people migrated from the east. Now, a better translation would be that they moved eastward or that they journeyed east. Uh, These people are moving in an easterly or southeasterly direction. And that means trouble. Because to move east in Genesis is almost always associated with moving away from God. Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden of Eden to the east. After murdering his brother, Cain went into exile in the east. When Lot separated from his uh, uncle Abraham, he went eastward to Sodom and Gomorrah. When Jacob fled his homeland, he went east. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong about the east. But in Genesis, to move east signifies separation. It signifies rebellion. It signifies moving outside of the sphere of God's blessing. You see, these people are heading in the wrong direction. I wonder whether that could be said of you this morning. As you look at your life and the direction you're going in, are you going in a direction that is bringing you closer to God? Or are you going in a direction that is taking you away from God? With these people, they are moving away. So there's the direction in which they're going. But also notice the goals that they have. Why are they building the city? What's the point of this tower? Well, we're told in verse 4. Then they said to one another, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, And let us make a name for ourselves. Can you see that they're not building to the glory of God? This is all about them. 
They're making a name for themselves. And isn't that interesting? Isn't that interesting? As they move away from God, these people try to find significance and immortality in their own achievements. Now that has a very contemporary ring to it, doesn't it? Our society is definitely moving in an easterly direction. It's definitely moving away from God. And as we move away from God, people are trying, aren't they, to find significance and immortality by making a name for themselves. For example, how else do we explain the proliferation of reality TV programs? Where have they all come from? And what lies behind them? We've reached a stage, haven't we, as a society where people are willing to do almost anything on TV if it gives them a moment's fame. And it's a telling indictment on the human condition. You see, it is in God that we find significance and immortality. But when we move away from him, We have to start looking for significance and immortality elsewhere. And all we have left is ourselves. Without God, the only significance we can find is what others give us. And the only immortality there is in a world without God is the hope that people might remember us. But the world's memory and the world's fame is incredibly fickle, isn't it? As the countless broken lives of reality TV show stars prove. I was reading a very disturbing article that was actually a a year old, but I only read it recently. But the article was just listing the number of people who have appeared on these types of shows and have had a a moment of fame, Uh, the number of them who have ended their lives. And if you're listening to the news or reading the papers, you'll know that that's happened even recently. It's so tragic. These people go on these programs looking for fame, but the fame is fleeting and and suddenly uh, uh, they return to the, the drudgery of normal life. They don't have the buzz of that fame anymore. And they can't see the point of going on. Can I ask you this morning, Where do you find significance? And where do you find immortality? Are you looking for significance without God? Are you looking for immortality without God? Friend, it will end badly. It will end badly. Significance and immortality is not found in the world or in making a name for ourselves. It is found alone in the God who made us. So the signs are bad, uh, both in terms of the direction that these people are going in and the priorities that they have, but also notice their defiance. We're told in verse 4, Then they said to one another, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now God said to Noah and his sons back in chapter 9, Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. But these people are saying, No, we're staying put. This city and this tower are acts of defiance. They're waving their fists 
in the face of God and saying, no, we are staying together. But I think if we listen to the text carefully, it's also clear that underneath this defiance, there is insecurity, painful insecurity. These people are afraid. They are afraid of being scattered. You see, man without God is inherently insecure. Without God, this world is a very scary place. So these people try desperately to stay together and the the tower is their rallying point, their focal point. Friends, I don't think you could find a more accurate commentary on the modern human condition than these verses. People are moving away from God, desperate to find significance and immortality, defiant and yet desperately insecure. Welcome to the 21st century. Welcome to life without God. So there's the sinister side to man's amazing ingenuity. Men are able to do impressive things. But it's also deeply disturbing. Lastly, there is God's reaction to man's amazing ingenuity. How does God react? Is he impressed with what he sees? As the Tower of Babel begins to rise up to the heavens, is God in awe of man? Is he afraid of what man can do? Well, notice that God reacts in two ways. Firstly, he comes down. Listen to verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and tower which the children of man built. Kids, have you ever used a microscope? Uh, Perhaps you've used one at school. And you know that microscopes make things that are, are tiny, that are not visible to the naked eye. Under normal circumstances, they make those tiny things visible. Well, the Tower of Babel is so tiny that God has to come down to see. Now, of course, God is everywhere and sees everything, but the Bible is using picture language here to help us understand. The people think they are building a tower that reaches up to the heavens. Uh, interestingly, the, uh, the word Babel sounds like an Akkadian word. Uh, Akkadian was a Mesopotamian language. Uh, the word Babel sounds like an Akkadian word meaning gate of God. Uh, perhaps these people think that their tower is the gateway to heaven itself. But in reality, it is a pitiful structure that God has to stoop down to see. And so it is with all of man's greatest achievements. In the sight of God who is enthroned in the heavens, in the sight of the great God of heaven... Everything that we do, even the greatest things that we do, are of no significance. So he comes down. But the second thing that God does is he confuses and scatters. 
The triune God says to himself in verse 7, Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. Now, whilst the word Babel uh, does sound like an Akkadian word for gate of God, yet in Hebrew, the word Babel means confusion. Now, you see, what we have here is a, a subtle play on words. So God confuses their speech. Uh, imagine what that must have been like. I, I don't know, but perhaps they all went to bed uh, speaking one language and they woke up the following morning uh, speaking uh, a dozen languages. It, it must have been Bedlam if it happened that way. But having confused the languages, God then scatters them over the face of the earth and their pet project grinds to a halt. The very thing that they feared the most uh, has happened. And this explains chapter 10. Well, we didn't read uh, chapter 10 in its entirety, but chapter 10 is a, a genealogy that shows Uh, the descendants of Noah's sons and the rise of various nations and languages. And what chapter 11 verses 1 to 9 does is it explains how that came about, how we ended up with a world of, of many peoples and many languages. Now the question is, why does God react this way? Why does he bring man's greatest plans to naught? And of course, what God did at Babel, he has done repeatedly in the history of this world. In the Bible, Babel or Babylon uh, stands for world power and man's defiance. And again and again, empires have risen on the face of this earth, but God has scattered them. Empires come and go. Uh, Sometimes those empires are geographical empires, uh, like Rome. Uh, Sometimes they are uh, empires of the mind, like communism. But they come and they go, and they come and they go, because God tolerates them for a while, but then scatters them to the four winds. We've actually witnessed witnessed these things in our own lives, haven't we? Up at the house, I have a map uh, printed two years after the birth of my father, and it shows one quarter of the world's population as being part of the British Empire and it shows all the different goods that came from the different parts of the empire and the amount of trade that was taking place. And at the top is a picture of George V who is called the King Emperor. But it's all gone. Many of us uh, here this morning were born into a time when the world was divided uh, into great two spheres of influence. The sphere of influence of the United States and democracy uh, and the sphere of the Soviet Union and communism. But communism has gone. And even now the United States is on the way. Now why? Why does this happen? Why does God sweep them away? Well, let me say firstly that we should be grateful that he does. As the Lord's people, we should always be suspicious of the concentration of power. Because most of these empires have been godless and they have rarely been friends of God's people. And what our Lord has done to the empires of the past should reassure us about the empires of the present, which increasingly are hostile towards us as the Lord's people. Friends, they will have their day, but God will sweep them all away. 
That's the case with the new superpower that is rising in the east, China. It will have its day, but then it will be swept away. Uh, that's true of the empires of the mind in, in our day. Uh, secularism and the whole gender movement and activism, they will have their day. But God will sweep them away. And we should be grateful. Now, we still haven't answered the question, have we? Uh, why does God sweep the empires of this world away? Why does he frustrate mankind's big ideas and big plans? Well, the answer is to humble us and to show us that we cannot bridge the gap between ourselves and God. It shows us that we must look outside of ourselves for deliverance. One of the interesting features of our text this morning is the fact that it marks the conclusion of the general history of this world. From now on, the Bible's focus narrows considerably. In chapter 10 and uh, chapter 11, verses 10 to 26, we have another genealogy. And by the end of it, one man comes into view. His name is Abraham. And from now on, Abraham and his descendants will be the Bible's focus. Now, Abraham, Abraham and his descendants won't rule over a vast empire. In fact, they will be repeatedly conquered by other empires. Abraham and his descendants will not build any ziggurats or pyramids or parthenons or colosseums. Compared to the great empires of history, Abraham and his descendants will be a sideshow. So why focus on them? Well, you see, thousands of years after the events of our passage, a teenage girl, a descendant of Abraham, will give birth to a little baby boy in a stable. And he will bridge the gulf between God and men. He will give real significance and true immortality to millions. It's shocking, isn't it? It's, it's almost deeply offensive, and it's particularly deeply offensive to the arrogant, unbelieving hearts of men. You can imagine somebody saying, are you telling me that, that this child born to a teenage mother uh, who grew up in the back of beyond and spent the majority of his life as a carpenter and then died an ignominious death on a cross? Are you telling me that he is more important than all the great empires of history? That he is more important than all of man's greatest achievements? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. Because it's true. Because he is no ordinary child. He is the fulfillment of the promise given to Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3 and 15. He is God the Son who has come down from heaven to earth so that we might go from earth to heaven. Not by some mud brick, tar smeared skyscraper, but through his shed blood that deals with the sin that drove us out from God's presence in the first place. 
Friends, history is his story. History is the story of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you want significance and immortality, if you want a restored relationship with God, if you want heaven, then don't sit, set your hopes on man and his puny achievements. Set your hopes on the God man, on the Lord Jesus Christ who has been sent into this world to bridge the gap between ourselves and God and to restore our relationship with the God of heaven. Friends, as we come to the conclusion of our study of Genesis 1 to 11, what we are left with is the gospel. And what we are left with is our need of the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's bow to him this morning. Let's throw ourselves utterly upon him and his grace. And then we will receive the significance and the immortality that we crave so much then our relationship with God will be restored, then we will have a sure and certain hope of eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful Father, we thank you for your word this morning and for the way that it has spoken to us. We thank you for the way in which it speaks with such clarity and such relevance to us in the 21st century and reminds us yet again that our greatest need is the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may we not seek significance in immortality in this world and in the people of this world, but may we seek these things alone in the one who can actually grant us these things, even the Lord Jesus Christ. Bless your word to our hearts this morning, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.